During a national or international epidemic, we rely on information from reputable health groups. In the United States, that is the Centers for Disease Control, and internationally, it's the World Health Organization. But even these groups get bogged down by politics. Here to talk about the role of global politics during an epidemic is Dr. Jeremy Ude, Dean of UMD's College of Liberal Arts and a global health politics expert. And doctor, thank you so much for coming in. We really appreciate it. Thanks for the invitation. Um, now, in your experience, have we ever faced anything like we're, we're seeing right now with the COVID-19 pandemic? Really, you have to go back to the 1918 flu uh, epidemic that we saw at the tail end of World War I. You know, we, can, we have seen other uh, infectious disease outbreaks, obviously. We have SARS, we had pandemic influenza in 2009. We've had other sorts of diseases like this, but nothing quite to this scale and nothing that has moved so rapidly. Plus, it's something that we've not seen before. So that novelty makes it that much more difficult because we're also still trying to learn in the process of trying to figure out the policy response. Mm -hmm. Dr. Yud, we didn't have time to put all your uh, kind of all your official criteria in our intro, your bio, so to speak. But talk a little bit about the organizations that you've been involved with and, and why you know so much about this. Sure, my primary, a lot of my interest has been focused on the World Health Organization, how it works with uh, with different governments to try to affect a response to an international uh, infectious disease outbreak. Because one of the things that we know is that no country is going to be able to control an outbreak like this on its own. Even if a country tries to close itself off completely, there's still the possibility of cases being introduced. And so trying to figure out how we're going to keep an eye on where cases are happening, make sure that we're sharing information, that we're sharing best practices and taking care of all of these sorts of steps that can be important, thinking about the policy responses, that's within the international system, that's the role of the World Health Organization. Now, they can't necessarily compel governments to do specific things. They can't force a government to say, you have to do X, Y, or Z, but they can provide best practices. They can provide that, that information. And in a time like this, it's so important to facilitate that sort of communication. Mm -hmm. So as you've been watching uh, this pandemic unfold, do you think that governments around the world are, are taking it seriously and are working well to coordinate what they're doing to contain things? I think we've had a mixed bag so far. Uh -huh. um, you know, There was some criticism of the World Health Organization for delaying when it declared a public health emergency for, for COVID-19. And you know, it, it's always hard to know in the midst of finding out all this information about a new disease, whether the time is right. Should, it be do should you be doing this sooner or later? It's it's hard to, to say, but, but the World Health Organization has been doing that. Governments themselves have been having a kind of a mixed record. So we've seen examples all the way from the Chinese government, which essentially closed off major cities and tried to restrict travel and keep people in place. We've seen other countries that have taken very aggressive approaches to testing and trying to uh, close down mass public gatherings like we've seen in Singapore and, and South Korea. We've seen other governments that have, have you know, looking at the, the Italian government, for instance, and essentially closing off the country and closing down tourism. And there's a, an economy and a government that really relies on tourism, and lots of people coming in. And so that's having the, the, these sorts of effects. So we really do see a mixed bag. And I think after the fact, we're going to look back and try to learn the lessons and see if there are things we can apply going forward. But right now in the moment, everyone's trying to, to figure out the, the, the best step forward. And so we're going to see a lot of missteps. Mm -hmm. Health and healthcare in general um, have become such a political hot potato in, in our country, mm -hmm. even under the best of circumstances. Um, there's so much partisanship in the country right now, and there's a, a you know, in some corners, a, a distrust of politicians, mm -hmm. a distrust of the media. How, how do you circumvent that and, and get people to pay attention um, to a, a global pandemic like this when people are wary of the information that they're receiving? Absolutely. In these sorts of instances, the two things that are so key are communication and trust. Sharing the information, here's what we know, here's what we don't know, and how we're trying to find this information, and getting that information from reliable, trusted sources. And so the important things can be making sure that government officials are speaking with one voice, that they're sharing the same message, that you're not hearing different messages from different parts of the government, um, that this information is coming from people who have, have strong reputations. And we've seen a lot of that doing working out really well at the state and local level, I think it, both in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and really across the country, the state and local level has been working out really well. Um, at the national level, I think we've seen more mixed messages, and that gets to exactly the point that you were talking about. People are unsure who they should trust. Should I be listening to the CDC? Should I be listening to what I'm hearing on this newspaper or from this TV station? Should I be trusting this random person that I'm finding on, on Twitter who's telling me that it's <laughs> a biological weapon? You know, there, there is that, that sort of confusion. So that's why speaking with one voice and having a clear, consistent message does become so important. And when you don't have that, you do introduce all of this ambiguity and all this uncertainty. 
Beyond the messaging, do you think that the United States uh, national government, federal government, has, has taken some proper steps? We're seeing some of the, the uh -huh. proper steps, but, but again, there have been sort of two steps forward, one step back in, in a lot of sort of instances. So even uh, today we saw the national emergency being declared by the president. That's a good step because it does introduce additional funding available for state and local governments, and that will allow those uh, agencies to be able to implement new programs, so that can be really effective. But on the flip side, it's taken us a, a long time. We've seen the, these mixed messages coming from the president, from other officials, and so that, is, that makes it hard to plan and hard for, for agencies to know what should we be doing when we're trying to implement these these policies in our local communities. No, mm -hmm. Dr. Yud, I mean we're 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 still in the middle of this. We're not quite sure how it's going to end mm -hmm. up, but in the long run, do you think that maybe we're going to learn something and maybe the next epidemic, maybe we're lucky that this one isn't quite as severe as far as death toll as it as some pandemics quite possibly could be. That's the hope, that, that we can learn lessons and we can try to, uh, to affect better responses in the future. If nothing else, I think this has really taught the importance of having strong public health systems and having pandemic preparedness plans ready to go because we don't know what the next pandemic is going to be. We don't know what the next infectious out disease outbreak will be or when it will happen, but we know we will have future ones. So the more that we can try to prepare ourselves and have those, those procedures ready to go if they need to be implemented, I think we will end up learning a lot from this. At least that's Fingers crossed, that's my hope. <laughs> the U.S. seems to be in, in pretty good shape in terms of healthcare expertise and infrastructure to, to get a handle on a, a widespread epidemic. Um, do you feel that there's the, the political appetite to, to provide the resources to, to kind of wrap around what we're seeing right now? Well, it depends on what sort of resources we're talking about. So we have seen some resources allocated by Congress and the president has signed that, that legislation. With this national uh, emergency uh, declaration, that also opens up additional resources. So that takes care of a lot of the, the, the health care resources. But we also have to recognize that if we're closing down schools or daycare centers, that has an effect on people. If we're closing down um, the ability of people to go to work, if we're telling them that they need to stay home or we are telling people to, uh, to shelter in place and not being able to go to, say, the grocery store. We need to have those other sorts of supportive services so that people can still continue to, to live their lives, they can get their medicines, they can do those sorts of things while still protecting themselves and protecting the rest of their community. All right, Dr. Jeremy Yu, thank you so much for sharing some of your expertise with us. Appreciate you coming in today. Stay healthy. You too. Thank nice you so much. Thank you.